So this is the next lecture for Western Civ 2. I think that might make it lecture 10. I'll have to double check that, but at Western Civ 2. This is a second part of our art and architecture lecture, uh, passing through the middle of the 20th century from around 1920 to around 1960. And one of the things that you find as the 20th century goes on is increasing levels of abstraction. Now, the word abstract, when it applies to art, means not being figuratively, figurative. If something is abstract, it's not figurative. A figure is something that represents something in the real world, or at least something that we've come to establish, you know, like a unicorn. You know, if I drew a picture of a unicorn, you'd all know what a unicorn was. If I drew a picture of a house, you'd all know that's a picture of a house. That's a figurative drawing. What you're looking at here is by a uh, an artist named Diller, Burgoyne Diller, and it is a pretty typical example of mid-20th century art. This is a painting, and you can see that it is multiple colors. Let me get a little more light on it. Maybe that'll be a little better. Um, it's multiple colors, but everything is a right angle or it's a block. It doesn't represent anything at all. It is completely abstract. Now, you might think this is one of those kinds of art. It's with the coming of abstraction that you get people saying, well, any third grader could do that. Well, maybe they could do it with their, with their hands, but the point of art is not the skill of the hand. It's the mind that creates, right? The aesthetic creation. So the artist here is using these colors, and if you'll recognize what they are, these colors, red, blue, and yellow, are the primary colors. White is the presence of every wavelength of light. Black is the absence of any light at all. So it's the totality of light, the total absence of light, and the three primary colors. Now, abstraction in art really began to take off after World War I. And as I said before in architecture in the last lecture, abstraction was meant to be universal. The artist who does this kind of thing is trying to make a statement that every human on the face of the earth, regardless of their cultural background, can appreciate. Um, we're going to see as we go on what's called abstract expressionism. Uh, that's where the artist is trying to touch your emotions. Now, I would say this is not so much an emotional thing. I don't know about you, but I don't really feel a strong emotional attachment to this thing. It's an intellectual thing. I start thinking about the primary colors and colors and light and straight angles, and it's very mathematical. It's kind of appreciation you might have for a geometry theorem or something. So this is an abstraction, but it's not yet abstract expressionism. Just to give you another example, there is another example of an abstract expressionist painting. Not all right angles this time, different shapes, different colors, but it is abstract again. All right. Now, we're going to pass over that, arc, that uh, sculpture there. Uh, here is a piece of sculpture. As you see, it dates from 1937. Theodore Razak, Construction in White is what it's called. Construction in White. Let's see if I can get a little better light on it for you. Construction in White. And it's all a kind of off-white. But what he's doing is he's giving these geometric shapes... And since it is a sculpture, it's actually a what's called a bas-relief sculpture, a low-relief sculpture. It uses shadow to show depth. As the light comes on it, of course, it leaves shadows. So that's a piece of 19, what, 1937 abstract sculpture. But you've seen some of this before. I'll bet you've seen an Alexander Calder mobile before. Mobiles are called that because they were mobile. They were able to be moved. And so those pieces that are sticking up on that long fishing pole-like thing would actually move. So again, we have 
Black and red are the only colors. This thing would actually move in the wind, or if you touched it with your hand, and it would be moving. That is Alexander Calder. This is pure abstract sculpture. Here's another Calder up here. Now that is not purely abstract, right? Clearly there are two human figures, and you can see from the front that's a deer maybe, or a dog. I'm not quite sure what kind of animal it's supposed to be, but it's a long, but, but it's not purely abstract. Oh, it's a wolf. Notice the title. My apologies. Romulus and Remus. And you'll remember that story. The co-founders of Rome suckled by a she-wolf. So I guess this must be the suckling, uh, the teats for the suckling there. So one of the oldest sculptures in Western art is the she-wolf that was made by the Etruscans 2,700 years ago and once had Romulus and Remus under it. So Calder here in 1928 was doing that. But notice 28 and 1931. This, is, this one is later. It's after he becomes more abstract. So that's abstraction. Oh, there's another Alexander Calder mobile. Very famous one there. Uh, and it hangs up. It hangs from like the ceiling. It's 8 feet 6 inches high and 9 feet 6 inches in diameter. So it's pretty big, but this would turn, this would turn, and this would turn. That might remind you something of a fish. And it says lobster trap and fish tail. So is, you know, I guess this is a lobster trap. I don't know what the heck. But you can see all these calders. There's another calder there, the white frame. Well, there you go. That's purely abstract again. It doesn't figure anything. This thing clearly is meant to figure something. That one, nothing at all. All right, but now we're going to move on more into the middle of the 20th century. This is a very famous Pete Modrion boogie woogie, sorry, Broadway boogie woogie. So you know Broadway in New York City with all the neon lights, all the flashing lights. Well, what he's done is he's taken these tiny squares in his lines. Everything's right angles. Again, everything is white or primary colors and all these right angles, but he's trying to give you a sense of excitement. Don't these things look almost like they're moving? Your eye can't help but move. So it is truly completely abstract, 1942 to 43, made during World War II, but he's trying to convey to you the sense of excitement of Broadway without anything that's actually figurative. That is abstraction. Now, Abstract expressionism is another thing altogether. There is an example of abstract expressionism. It's abstract. There is no figure there at all. Hans Hoffmann, Spring, 1944-45. Um, it is purely abstract. It doesn't have any figure in it at all. It's smeared paint all over this canvas. But he is trying to use color and these wild lines to give you emotions, to do something to your emotions. Look down here, and again, it's not completely abstract. I think I can see some figures of something, but take a look at that darn thing, and you tell me if you can figure out what the heck Ashiel Gorky is actually trying to represent. Is it figurative? The liver is the coxcomb. I don't know what the heck that means. That's the title of this piece from 1944 but it's meant to strike your emotions. Willem de Kooning, black and white, just these lines. Again, no actual uh, representation of anything, no figurative representation. This is a figure, a human figure, woman one, it's called, it's a de Kooning. So it does stand for a woman, but again, it is very different than any figurative painting you've seen. Now, Jackson Pollock is the most famous abstract expressionist painter. He's an American. Here's an early abstract expressionist painting of his. And you can see that he's painted with a brush here. But this is what truly made him famous. Jackson Pollock's drip paintings. This is number 1A is the name of this thing, done in 1948. In the late 40s and the 1950s, Jackson Pollock started taking his canvases, laying them on the ground, and then walking on them, drizzling paint 
from a brush out of a can. Sometimes he'd fling paint on the things with his fingers, cut the paint in his hand and hurl it on there. But it is all done by gravity and throwing paint at the canvas. Obviously, there couldn't be anything representational about this. This is pure abstract expressionism. Now, this is exactly what people complain about in modern art. But I want you to get the idea of the artist. What were these people doing abstract expressionist drip paintings like Jackson Pollock? What's he trying to do? He is trying to make a statement about creativity. You know, 150 years ago, almost everybody judged a painting on how naturalistic it was. How much like a, what a modern color photograph with a digital camera it looked like. That really is the kind of things in 1800 people considered great art was the artist's ability to mimic reality, to mimic nature like a, like a brilliant digital camera photograph today. Well, photography is already a well-advanced science by 1948. If you want a naturalistic image of something, take a great color photograph with Kodachrome film. So Pollock is saying painting should be something else. Painting should touch the emotion. Painting should stir you to think. And if you sit there for 20 minutes looking at this thing, who knows what will come into your head? <laughs> you know, that is a lot of what they're trying to do, these abstract expressionists. Now, here is a Franz Klein Nijinsky. He was a male ballet dancer. Um, I think I'm right about that. <laughs> um, but anyway, 1950. So this, again, is not figurative. I don't see any ballet dancer there myself. But I can kind of see how you could see spinning arms and legs represented by this abstract form. All right. So you can see that that's 1950. Now we're going to move to Mark Rothko. And Mark Rothko is another very famous American painter after World War II. Pure abstract images. And it's expressionist. It's meant to touch your emotions. But here he does it with blotches of color. Pollock's got these thin lines and splashes. There's a kind of violence in Pollock's painting. <coughs> Pardon. A kind of violence in the Pollock's drip paintings. You can see how the paint was splashed and dropped. But here, Rothko likes smoother. He wants you to think about pure color. Or if you get up close to them in person, you can see the, the texture of the paint on the canvas. But this is more what most people think of as Mark Rothko. These bands of different kinds of color. Now, he had to spend hours, days, perfecting the color. So it's not just random. And look how it subtly shades around. You know, this is not first grade work, although it might seem at first blush to you that it is. It's not. It is color. More, this is not Rothko, this is Barnett and Newman. But again, does that sort of slightly jagged, brighter line down the center say something to you? Does it make you think maybe, a, I don't know, a dagger of light? I don't know what, but you know, these, this is another Newman up here. So this is the kind of art that the 1950s produced. Here's an American sculpture by David Smith, 1950. Again, uh, this has got some figurative elements in it. You can see what look maybe like human figures or not. I'll leave it to you to tell me what that is. It's, a, it's about uh, three feet high and a little less than two feet wide. Clearly like somebody stands on a desk or a pedestal or something. It's uh, cast in, I think, wheel, welded steel. Does it make a statement that it's in steel? Another figure from the 1950s, same artist, David Klein, 1956. Now, this is called Sentinel, like a guard on a guard post. Sentinel 1, 1956, painted steel. Anyway, friends, that's a quick survey of art, um, painting and sculpture in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s and 50s.